Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! What happens, though, if the housing problem in this country has become too big to solve with normal tweaks and adjustments? Grant Shapps, a fellow Tory, admitted today the need had come for radical change unless we want to carry on, he said, having the same conversation for another five years. Well, some parts of the country have taken market regulation into their own hands, drastic measures to cut down on out-of-towners, buying up all the most juicy housing stock. Evan Davis heads to both St Ives in Cornwall and to the island of Jersey to see what plans the locals have cooked up to keep things affordable for them. Jersey may be famous for its picturesque views, for cows and potatoes, but like the UK, it's far more a financial services economy than a tourist or agricultural one. In fact, it's a tiny microcosm of Britain. It's only 100,000 people, but it's well off and a magnet to migrants from across the EU. The other feature of this place is that it's very densely populated. It doesn't always feel like it, but it's actually three times as densely populated as Britain. We could take another 100 million people and still be emptier than Jersey. So, it's crowded, lots of people want to come here. That creates a problem with housing. So, complex rules here govern the allocation of homes, providing a form of immigration control and protecting the locals. You either qualify as having full access to the housing market, or you don't. A local estate agent explains the basics. As a qualified local, you are free to rent or purchase any property. There is no entry level, there is no ceiling. Um, the market is yours. As a non-qualified person or somebody new to the island that's not coming here through an employer, um, they unfortunately have to rent at the lower end of the market um, and spend 10 continuous years here paying tax before they then become entitled to purchase anything and everything. Before they qualify. So we have a 10-year qualifying period um, before we accept you into, uh, into our own. It's a development of 35 one and a half bedroom units, which are for over 55s only. It is the same story with social housing, also allocated with long-term residents in mind. How do I get a social property if I'm in Jersey? Well, you firstly need to meet the criteria to be classed as residentially qualified, so that's the 10 years residency. And then following on from that, you'd need to uh, apply to the Affordable Housing Gateway, which has another set of criteria which just helps us to ascertain um, the level of need that you're actually in in order to access the market of social housing. You probably thought it was a market economy here. In housing, far from it. We control not only housing, so who can buy it, who can rent, uh, by the number of years that they've been here. We also control work uh, and businesses through jobs licences uh, and the number of jobs that they can have, again determined by the length of time that somebody's been here. Francis is a tenant of the main social housing provider, Andy and Holmes. She's been here decades and worked hard as a hotelier and feels the system is quite fair. I do feel that I've worked and paid my taxes and really, you know, um, when I needed help, they were there to help me. Uh, although before I'd put a lot back into the community. Suppose that Jersey removed all the restrictions on housing and went for a, a market system. Here's what I suspect would happen. A few more non-Jersey folk would move in and a few more Jersey natives would move out or would go off to college somewhere and never come back. Well, we are used to markets and their inequalities. We know that the rich get nice cars and the poor maybe get none. But housing is different. Is it acceptable that locals can be priced out of their own community? From Jersey to Guernsey, even to Liechtenstein, microstates, 
have often controlled entry and ownership, and it's been considered an acceptable form of self-protection. But is something similar to the Jersey method relevant to the United Kingdom? Well, toes are being put in the water here in St Ives in Cornwall. Again, it's a nice place. Lots of people want to be here. In summer, it gets packed. And wealthy second homeowners, for example, want to buy houses here. The issue is not foreigners, but it's still about the balance between outsiders and permanent residents. So there are two forms of housing which are excluded from the locals' market. I, I think we're, if we carry on the way we are, we're, we're just about a generation away of St Ives becoming a ghost town. All those people who live here um, turn this beautiful looking place into a, ha uh, a thriving community would not be able to live here therefore they wouldn't be able to work here, the shops wouldn't get staff, the restaurants wouldn't get staff, and, and as I say, we, we, it would be shut for most of the year. Last May, they had a referendum on a local plan to change things. Lots of local people were involved. Any new build from the time that the plan is made, and it was passed into law on the 29th of December, um, any new build um, has to be lived in as a home. The result was pretty overwhelming, and it survived a court challenge. The effect is there'll be two markets. For existing homes, an open market, and for new-built homes, a local one. Only locals can buy new-built houses, and they'll only be able to sell them on to other locals. The precise effects are hard to know. The whole thought process behind it is completely wrong. It's going to only increase second home value in the town, make it harder for affordability for the local people and the land value is going to remain very high so the developers are going to disappear and go elsewhere which they are starting to do. Now you can see the locals difficulty even if they could build loads and loads and loads of extra homes around here without ruining the place well, it wouldn't solve the problem because all that would happen is lots and lots and lots of outsiders would come in and snap them up. There's huge demand. That's why they think you have to have a rule about who gets the homes. What happens in St Ives doesn't necessarily stay in St Ives. London has some of the same problems as do other crowded, growing parts of the UK. Is it possible to contemplate that these other places might resort to the same kind of interventions. Evan Davis uh, with that report. Well, joining us now, Dan Sujic, director of the Design Museum, Daisy May Hudson, who is a documentary maker, and Patrick Schumacher, who's director and principal of Zaha Hadid Architects. A warm welcome to all of you. Is market intervention, then, as we've just seen, the right way to go? It's an emergency button, but Patrick, is it time to press it? Um, I believe so. Um, but I'm not speaking as the principal of Saadid Architects, but we uh, acting professionally within an existing policy frame. But as a thinker and somebody who's in various think tanks, I am thinking about policy and thinking ahead. And I'm looking at the white paper and I find uh, it's not radical enough. I agree with the Labour Party, but it's radical, uh, not radical enough in, in another direction, where I think we, we, I would expect market processes to solve a lot of these crises, which are supply crises where um, far too many restrictions are placed on developers with respect to density, with respect to use categories, with respect to unit mixes and minimum you, you sizes. You think it's too restrictive then far for those who want to far develop? Too restrictive. So the headline, I agree, that the housing market is broken. Uh, but when you see, for example, St Ives saying we're not going to sell new builds to out-of-towners or Jersey saying, you know, we're, you have to stay here 10 years before you get to buy a, a place in Jersey, does, is that the right cure? Um, no, that's an intervention in markets, in fact. But those so are the I same problems that are facing parts of London where the same problems that face St Ives happen in a different way, that school teachers or policemen or restaurant workers can't afford to stay in parts of London, which have become, as they say, buy to forget places which are used as investment by the market, which has completely distorted the way that we live in large parts of the capital and other cities do. This is all over. This is all over the UK, isn't it? The Lake District, the Cotswolds, anywhere where there are these beautiful sort of second home villages. I mean, should they all start doing this? Not at all. I think uh, there are two ways of foreign investment into London. We should welcome all of it. Some of it is bringing in money to, to uh, invest, build, to rent. 
And another lot is bringing in for second homes, which are also used. These are still very useful because these are uh, okay. global, uh, global entrepreneurs who have their second home to do business. To Daisy, I wonder what you hear when, when, when Patrick says, you know, it's too restrictive, it's too, too confining for developers or builders. Yeah. What's your sense? Well, I've, um, through my experience of kind of um, activism around London, working with different residents on different estates across London, I've noticed that actually there are restrictions put on developers and they're still managing to bypass them. Not, um, they're not building enough affordable housing. They're using loopholes to kind of uh, to invest in to minute amount of money into the community. So I don't understand how taking away restrictions would make this issue any better. What would you do? Well, for we had actually just a discussion outside uh, with, with some of the colleagues who were on before. For instance, uh, a lot of younger people, professionals wanting to buy. And I was asking one of the co colleagues there, her, that uh, what kind of size of apartment would she be willing to buy? Was 20 square meter, 30 square meter sufficient to be into the housing ladder? She said, yes, she would, she would go for this. But in the moment, there are restrictions with, with, with sizes, which have to be much more. So they're minimum sizes. And well, ask cannot, Daisy. Yeah. I mean, is that, is that the answer for you? Something very small, but gives you the, the sense of <laughs> ownership is that more important than space or size or and renting um no i think we're now in such dire straits that the issue isn't about people wanting to own their own home i think it's just people need somewhere to to live and call and call a home home doesn't mean that you have to own it a home is a place that gives you security gives you um a sense of belonging and it gives you a sense of uh, of identity and really a lot of people would happily rent as long as there was, an, there was enough kind of guidelines in. I mean, this in, is, I agree with that. I mean, also I think renting rent accommodation should also be able to be smaller, but and what, that's also what respected. We, what we build is as important as how much we build. I think everyone agrees that we need to build more. I think we should build a lot more. Um, in 1970, Britain built almost 400,000 homes. We're down to less than 200,000 now, which is crazy. But Population the culture of Britain has been, if you like, to encourage people to increase their wealth, hasn't it, through property ownership. Is that fair? Should we treat property in the same way that you might invest in, you well, know? Maybe we should talk about how we live rather than how we actually afford our pensions. And actually creating places people want to stay in and live in seems to be the chance we have with this reset, if that's what it is. From I the think government. there's far too much emphasis on ownership as a retirement and saving vehicle. I also think there's a lot of um, onus on the idea that people want to make money out of housing and ideologically that's why we're in this mess because um, you know there are people making money from the housing crisis exactly the way it is so when when I read kind of what the government... Do you find that unethical? No, I think the profit and loss system is an absolute necessary signalling whether an investment is uh, efficient or whether investment is inefficient and actually using up more resources than it delivers. So we, Patrick, we need to live Patrick, in London is being wrecked by mm -hmm. the way that the private developers are being forced to carry on the burden of those things that the state has stepped back from. So the reason that those high rises around Battersea, for example, go so high is that they're being expected to pay for things that they shouldn't. So put another 10 stories on. Let's create another, I mean, it's creating a, an area which in 10 years' time will be one of the slums that we kind of regret from this. So would you at this point say um, London should have the same attitude to foreign investment, whether it's, you know, rich Chinese business folk buying stuff in central London? Should, should, should this city say no? Well, the history of planning does show that unintended consequences tend to follow from attempts to do things in a big way. So back in the 60s, the Labour government tried to limit office building by restricting uses and it created a boom instead. We need to be careful what we do. I think too, too often we go for very quick solutions. You can see areas of Britain where mm. slums have been demolished and rebuilt three times in one lifetime. The, the, polit the political time scale is just too fast to actually deal with some of these I things. Think Having been homeless myself um, with my family, to hear about housing discussed in kind of such alien um, market terms just see, just doesn't sit well with me. Housing is a basic human right. I get, I'm, I'm constant in contact with people that don't have places to live, that are teachers, TFL workers, people that make this city work, that mm. make the UK work, and they don't have somewhere to live. So to sit here and kind of discuss it in terms of market and economy, just I think it completely just misses the point of the kind of issues that we are seeing in the UK at the minute. Well, I think that's precisely the problem that we need to, I'm all with you, 
my headline is housing for everybody and more housing, more affordable housing. And there's a number of policies uh, which are intuitively seeming sensible, which actually prevent this, which drive prices up, which restrict supply. And I, I've been, we should think out of the box and we need to think economics so and we should... Last word, if we're thinking out of the box, not if we look at being disruptive not caring, technologies, I'm very well, caring what about is that this. thing for housing? What is the, you know, the, the driverless car, if you like, for the housing market? It's understanding what the city is going to be like in 30 or 40 years' time and building for the future and doing things which actually last rather than are discarded after 20 years. All right. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks for joining Thank us you. here. Thank you. I've been getting away with it all.